Welcome back to Read the Bible for Yourself. Today we are covering part two, what you need to know about your Bible. And I want to begin with the question, what is the Bible? The Bible is not a book. Well, it looks just like a book. Oh, look at that. It's got pages, it's bound in a cover. Nice uh, fake leather cover, if you've got one like mine. Uh, it's got these little ribbons. Mine has two ribbons. I probably had paid extra for that. Who knows? Um, and, you know, it's got our, our text inside in different columns. Well, actually, the Bible is not a book. It is, in fact, a library. It's a collection of 66 books written by dozens of people, old and young, rich and poor, philosophers and farmers, theologians and historians over many centuries. It's not a normal book. And because the Bible is a collection of other books, 66 other books, that presents some unique challenges to us as readers. So I want to show you the 66 books of the Bible and just briefly read through them so that you can at least hear what they are. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. Even as I, just I'm reading through, it's like, it's incredible. There's so many books in here. That was the first 32. Number 33. Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1 2 Peter, 1 2 and 3 John, Jude, Revelation. Whew! Man. There's a, there's a lot here. There's a lot here to master. There's a lot here to learn about to discover, and the Bible will reward you. This is something I've experienced in my 25 years of, of reading the Bible seriously. The, I get rewarded. It just happened to me this morning. I was reading a genealogy of all places, which uh, is not where we want to start with this class, but I was in Genesis chapter 10 reading a genealogy, and I, and I, and I came across a name, and I was just like, I know that name. And, you know, I made a connection, a new connection, a new, like, neural connection in my brain that wasn't there before, and it was just, like, putting two things together that, you know, is, is a very gratifying experience as you are reading it year after year to, to always be learning something new and developing a deeper understanding. Now, the Bible's not really in chronological order, but it kind of is. It starts in the beginning, it ends in the end. Okay, that's good. But... In the middle, uh, there, there are some things that are ordered by section or by the kind of thing they are rather than strictly by the time at which they happened. So the two main sections of the Bible are the Old Testament, which is 39 books, and the New Testament, which is 27 books. Now, if we look at just the Old Testament, <coughs> we have these 39 books here. And we can break them into different... There are different ways of breaking up the Old Testament. But what I'm going to do here is just break it into three sections. We have our history, our poetry, and our prophecy. Three sections of the Old Testament, history, poetry, and prophecy. If you want to further break up the history, you could break it into the Torah, the Judges, the Kings, and the books related, relating exile related to the exile, so we call those exilic books. There's a little bit of a technical term there. Then in the poetry section, we have philosophy, songs, general wisdom, subversive wisdom, and romance. So there's a lot in that wisdom section in the middle. And then the prophecy has the major prophets and the minor prophets is usually how we divide that up. Uh, but there are problems with those kinds of names as well. And... Lamentations is, is kind of like awkwardly in the, the prophet section. Like, I understand why it's there, but it, it's not really a book of prophecy. It's, it, it's more of a wisdom literature book or a poetic book. All right, let's look at the books of the New Testament. The New Testament has 27 books in it. It has three sections, like the Old Testament has three sections. History, 
epistles and prophecy. So the history section has the four Gospels and then the book of Acts. And then the epistles, we could break them into Paul's epistles and then general epistles. We could do that right about here. So these would all be Paul's from Romans to Philemon, and then Hebrews through Jude are just more general epistles. A lot of times we know who wrote things. The book of Hebrews is uh, very much contested who wrote it. Uh, probably not Paul, although a lot of people assume that. It never says that. So these are different sections of the New Testament. So there is, there is a logic to how the Bible is, is put together. And the Jewish Bible has a different ordering and a different logic to how it's put together than the Christian Bible, but it has the same books, at least in the Old Testament. Their Old Testament is the same as our Old Testament. They wouldn't call it an Old Testament. They would just call it a Bible. And then the New Testament, there are different orderings for the New Testament, too. And the ordering of the books is not really significant. I don't think any of us are taking like cues on how to live life on the basis of the order of the books in the Bible. What really matters is that you have all of them, right? That <laughs> you have 66. So let's move on to talk about genres for a moment. We have historical, narrative, biography, law, poetry, prophecy, wisdom, epistles, and apocalyptic. Historical narrative, these are books like Genesis, the first half of Exodus, Numbers, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, Samuel, Kings, Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Jonah, Jonah is in the prophetic books, but it's actually historical, uh, historical narrative more than it is prophecy. There's actually only one prophetic statement all of, in all the book of Jonah. Uh, just, this just free, free, no extra charge for this little fact here. Um, and it's, in 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. That's literally the only prophecy he makes. Whole city repents. Incredible. But uh, it's not really a prophetic book. It's more of a historical narrative. And then um, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, all historical narrative as well. This is a huge portion of the Bible. I don't, I don't know, maybe half the Bible, but a, a huge, huge section of the Bible is historical narrative. And these are, these, the, the, we'll, as we get into this, and we'll, we'll do a whole session on just this one section of the Bible, we'll see their rules are different than our rules for writing history. And if you don't know the differences, you can really get turned around and confused or start getting, get, getting, um, thinking there are contradictions where there aren't contradictions or holding it to different standards than are really fitting for an ancient Bronze Age text, um, which is different than a newspaper in the 21st century. Um, these historical narratives are masterfully written. They're, they're just like world-class storytelling. It's not, this is not the cheap end, the, the uh, shallow end of the pool here, right? Even though it's easy to understand historical narrative, it, there's, there's so much artistry going on in how things are told and what is not said, what is left to your imagination. These, the stories are incredibly sparse, and yet you're able to really get a, a thorough like, experience or mind picture as you read through. And the, in the historical narratives, you sometimes get multiple documents or multiple books addressing the same subject or the same events. And when that happens, that's a, kind of a special case. It happens in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And um, then you, you can see multiple perspectives of the same event, just like multiple camera angles. Then we have biography. Biography includes books like Ruth, Part of Ezra, part of Nehemiah, Esther, Jonah, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are famous biographies of Jesus. Acts is a double biography of Peter and then Paul. Kind of switches between them halfway through. Um, I, I, I think it's important to recognize that writing a whole book about a person is kind of a special case of historical narrative. So you, you might want to fit this in to historical narrative, but I, I just made it a different category. Then you have law. Law is like the second half of Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. Some parts of the legal books of the Bible, the law books, they're highly technical. If this happens, then this is the penalty. But if this happens, then this is the penalty. 
and they'll have exception clauses, and they'll have different scenarios laid out. Uh, there's case law. There's uh, a lot of ancient understanding of covenants. It's really important for understanding how law works. Our laws are, are sort of derived to a large degree from the Bible's laws. I mean, they're not just like blatantly copied, but you know, there's a long history of influence from the Bible through the Byzantine era, of especially Justinian, and then into the medieval European law codes and English common law, finally to the United States. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of dependence going back, which is good for us because it makes it more easily understandable for us because we're kind of used to thinking a certain way about what should be allowed and not be allowed. Then we have poetry. Uh, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Lamentations. A lot of the prophets, a lot of the prophetic books uh, have these long poetic sections in them as well. I didn't really know how to write that in here, so I'll just mention that. But poetic books have their own rules, very different than historical narrative, and it's very important for you to understand what the conventions are, or else you're going to end up like Monty Python, totally misunderstanding what's going on, and making fun of it, or just being confused by it. And so we're, we're going to get into that in this class. There's uh, books of prophecy. Most of the books of prophecy are not predicting our future. By far, the majority of what the prophets do is they tell the people to get right with God. Tell their own people in their own time to get right with God. There are some prophecies of the future like from the prophet's perspective, their future. But these things have already occurred by our time. There, and then there are a few what we call eschatological prophecies or prophecies about the end, and those are yet to be fulfilled. And those are the ones we get excited about because we're like, oh, how's that going to work? How's it going to play out? And that sort of thing. So those are all in the prophetic books. Then you have wisdom. Wisdom books have their own logic, their own way of working, there are two kinds of wisdom. There are straightforward wisdom or general wisdom. Like generally if, you, generally, if you work hard, you will be successful in life. Generally. There are exceptions. You could get some freak disease. You could have an accident. There, there are lots of things that could happen. But generally, so that's like a straightforward wisdom like the book of Proverbs. Um, but then we have subversive wisdom, like Job and Ecclesiastes is dealing with like, okay, well, the world doesn't quite work the way it's supposed to all the time. What do I do then? How do I deal with that? And so that's what Job and Ecclesiastes are doing. And then we have other kinds of wisdom uh, literature, which we'll get into later. Then we have the epistles. Epistles are letters. So uh, the closest thing to a letter that young people would relate to would be what? A message? Because I think email is sort of like passe and a very adult. So like the, the younger people, they, they, if I say to you a letter, I wonder what you picture in your mind. Are you picturing a piece of paper with lines and, you know, cursive writing on it, you know, put it in an envelope, stamp it, seal it, send it, right? That's what I picture right? when I hear the word letter. Uh, but to other people maybe are picturing, picturing an email, or maybe a direct message on Snapchat or something. I don't know. But like, it's all the same thing, right? It's just different means of communicating what you want to say. The epistles are very long, though. They're not short generally. There are a couple of short ones, but many of them are very long by our standards today. Some of them are written to a church. Some of them are written to a leader. Some of them are written to Christians in general. So we'll be looking at all the different types of epistles and how epistles function in the Bible. And then last of all, we've got the apocalyptic genre. And this would include parts of Daniel uh, and parts of Zechariah and most of Revelation. This is kind of like the sci-fi fantasy section of the Bible where you have visionary imagery and lots of interesting symbolism. Then there are subgenres in the Bible. Within a, any particular book of the Bible, you can find other types of literature embedded. So you have parables, riddles, aphorisms, monologues, dialogues. 
and much more. So I just want to show you a couple of these. I want to show you a parable. And I know you're probably thinking of the parables of Jesus, so I'm not going to go there. I'm going to go instead to the parable of Nathan. 2 Samuel 12, 1 says, And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city. And that's, that's how a parable starts, right? It just jumps right in. And you have no idea. Is this a true story? Is this made up? Well, guess what? It's made up. doesn't matter. That's the way parables function. There were two men in a certain city, the one rich, the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there... Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. That's the whole story. Nathan tells the story to the king David. It says in verse 5, Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing, because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, you are the man. And David repented. David got it. You see, that's the power of the parable. The power of, of the parable is you don't know it's talking about you. You don't know really what it's talking about. And you're, and you're just like, yeah, that guy's a real jerk. <laughs> you know. And then it's, and Nathan, boom, drops a hammer. No, you're the man. David, it's you. You're the jerk. Now, if he just came in, if he had just come in to the king who had just murdered somebody to cover up his adultery, by the way, the Bible doesn't shy away from like real life, okay? And he had just said to him, David, you sinned, you're really evil. What would what would be the response? Probably not as powerful of a response. Maybe we would just kick him out, maybe we would have Nathan killed. Uh, but there is a power of the parable of telling that little fictitious story to really communicate. What about a riddle? Judges 14.14. 14. He said to them, Out of the eater came something to, something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. But for three days they could not explain the riddle. Do you know the answer to the riddle? Of the eater came something to eat, out of the strong came something sweet. The answer is, what is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? <laughs> and I will not go into explanation on this anymore. Riddles are confusing. They're, they're like, oh, I don't know what you're talking That's the whole point of a riddle. If you read Judges chapter 14, this would make perfect sense to you. We're not going to go into it right now, but... That's, that's an example of a riddle. Aphorisms are short, pithy, one or two liners, wisdom sayings. For example, Proverbs 15.1, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. That's an aphorism. It's just a short one or two liner that conveys a nugget of wisdom or a nugget of truth. Lots of monologues in the Bible. You could think of Job. Job doesn't really have dialogue in it. it it's, it's kind of like dialogue, but it's more like one person monologues than another person monologues, uh, taking turns and around, three rounds of three people. Or Jesus monologues a lot, like Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount is a monologue. And we have dialogues in the Bible. God asks Cain, where's, brother, where's your brother Abel? And Cain says to God, Am I my brother's keeper? I don't know where he is. And then God says to him, well, your brother's blood is crying to me out of the ground. And, and, then, you know, and then God punishes. He says, I'm going to curse you. And Cain says, oh, I can't handle this curse. It's too much. Right? There's this whole dialogue. There's back and forth in, in there. So we're going we're gonna to flush these out in much more detail in future sessions. We're going to take our time, go through each section of the Bible. We'll look at Old Testament history, how to focus on and read that genre. We'll look at the law, how to read that. We'll look at wisdom literature, prophetic, poetic, the Psalms, 
and we'll, we'll just work our way. And by the time we're done, you'll, you'll hopefully be better at reading the Bible than you are now, and that you will be able to feel more confident and say, yeah, I, I can tackle this. Because there are some parts of the Bible that are very difficult for all of us, uh, and other parts that are pretty easy, even for like the first time you read it. So we can avoid a lot of common pitfalls by going through this together. I mentioned last time about inspiration. We read that verse from 2 Timothy 3.16. I believe God inspired the text of Scripture, uh, but then a lot of what we see in our Bible, like if, for example, if you have a paper Bible like this, a lot of what we see on the page is not the text of Scripture. It's added stuff. All these extra numbers. We have a little heading over this chapter. I've got notes in the center in between the two columns. I've got all kinds of notes on the bottom here too. A lot of times Bibles will have introductions before a book of the Bible. And so I want to go through those things with you just briefly and talk about them because they are there when you read the text. Now, if you're reading an electronic text, you will still have some of these features, but not others, uh, depending on what kind of app you're using or what website you're on. So I want to look at additions to the text, and I want to make simply th this one simple point, which is really important. God inspired, I believe God inspired the text of Scripture. Everything that the publishers have added, these are their suggestions, these are, these are helps, but they're not, they don't have God's authority on them, okay? So let me explain what I mean. Chapters. Chapters were invented in the year 1205 by a guy named Stephen Langdon. And, and the chapters are great. I'm not complaining about the chapters, but God didn't pick where they go. Some guy did. And sometimes they break up the middle of a sentence or the middle of a thought. And you just need to realize these chapters are more like suggestions. They're helpful to like find something, but they don't contain like the authority of God behind them. Same thing with verses. Verses were added in the Old Testament in 1524 by Jacob ben Hayyim ibn Adonijah, and they were added in the New Testament in 1551 by Robert Estine, whose pen name was Stephanus. Verses are great, but sometimes they break up a sentence awkwardly. Then you have paragraph headings. They can be super helpful, but sometimes they inject theological bias into the Bible. Uh, book introductions. Book introductions are really hit or miss. It depends on who publishes your Bible. Within biblical scholarship, there are really two different streams flowing. There are critical scholars and evangelical scholars. And you know that's a little oversimplifying because there are Catholic, Catholic and Orthodox too. But just holding that to the side for a moment, there are people that are looking at the Bible from a very critical, like, we don't really believe this necessarily happened, we're just studying it academically. And then we have people that are studying the Bible as insiders that, that are going to take the Bible seriously for what it says and believe it in, in that vein. And those uh, are more the Bible-believing scholars, or sometimes called evangelical scholars. There are Catholic scholars on both sides of this. That's why I said it's a little complicated, because you have some Catholics that will lean more liberal, and some Catholic Bibles will lean more conservative, and some will, some will uh, say, oh, I don't think Paul really wrote that epistle. I don't think Peter wrote that. You know, I think there's three Isaiahs or two Isaiahs. You know, and, and there are a lot of books that are going to be like that, and then there are books that are going to be very conservative. And uh, so... When it comes to book introductions, as with all this rest of this stuff, there's going to be a bias. Whoever the publisher has hired, whatever scholars they are that worked on it, they bring their bias to the text, and so we just have to recognize that that is secondary. Uh, there's also cross-references in many Bibles. Uh, a lot of times those are in the center. If you have a dual-column Bible or footnotes, or if you're reading on your phone, cross-references will be like a, a, a little superscript or a star or something like that that you can tap on, and then it opens up and it lists out other Bible references there. Cross notes are super helpful. They are not inspired by God, once again, but they are helpful. Like, say, for example, you're reading the time where Jesus fed the 5,000 in Mark chapter 6. You're like, you know, I know there's other, there's other places in the Bible that talk about this. 
I wonder, does Matthew talk about the feeding of the 5,000? Does Luke? Does John? Do all four Gospels? Yes, yes, they do. And your cross-references will tell you, oh, well, here's where it is in Matthew, and here's where it is in Mark, and here's where it is in Luke, and here's where it is in John. And, and you can uh, be able to find stuff a lot. If somebody in the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, the cross-reference will tell you where the quotation comes from. You can go back to the Old Testament. You can read the, the quote and, in its original context, if that can be helpful. Um, but as anything, cross-references can be biased, linking scriptures together that really, in my opinion, don't belong together. Um, but generally, they're super helpful. Then we have textual notes. And that's the idea that uh, um, the, the, the edition of the Bible that you have will talk about the manuscripts. Like I said, there's five, almost 6,000 Greek manuscripts and then tens of thousands of other manuscripts. So <clears throat> sometimes there are differences between the manuscripts and they will uh, not be sure. Most of the time they, they have figured out, the scholars who work on this are called textual critical scholars, they have figured out which is more likely to be the original for 90 plus percent of the Bible. But there are some where they're like, oh, it really could be this or it could be that. If there is a doubt about which reading is more accurate, they will usually put a footnote. So that will alert the reader, oh, it could read this or it could read that. These, these differences are, tend to be extremely minor for the record, but they're still interesting. Um, then we have translation notes. This is where somebody rendering it from Hebrew into English or from Greek into English, and they're like, well, you know, we translated it this way, but it really could mean this, too. Because no two languages exactly overlay each other. So you get translation notes, you get study notes that just give you like helpful information. A cubit is 18 inches, an ephah is five gallons, you know, these kinds of things that uh, will be helpful. Um, some Bibles will have italicized words, notably the King James Version, the New American Standard Bible, and the Revised English Version are three that use italics to indicate words that the translator has added. These are words that are not in the original Bible, but they've added these words in to make a smooth English sentence. In English, normally, in English literature, we use italics to emphasize words. So uh, the fact that these italicized words are added words that should be de-emphasized can sometimes create some confusion. Uh, but that's what, we, you see an italicized word, it means it's less important, not more important, um, if you're reading one of those versions that does that. Some, some versions, like the New American Standard Bible, will capitalize, like use all caps. That doesn't mean they're shouting or it's more important. It means it's a quotation from the Old Testament. And some versions will use red words for Jesus' words. And you'll be reading along, and just even, even like electronic versions will do this with the red words, and you'll be like, oh, my font just went red. What happened? Well, Somebody had the bright idea, let's make Jesus' words red because, he, I don't know, he died on the cross and it was a blood, or I don't know. But uh, somebody somewhere just like started this trend, and uh, so it, it happens in a lot of different versions. And, um, you know, it can be helpful because you're like, oh, those are the, the actual words that Jesus said. These are obviously very important because Jesus said them. All right, let's look at references. I, I want to just cover the, some of these basics because they can be confusing. Uh, this is, this, these are three different examples of the same reference. Uh, this, uh, this refers to 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 4. So in the first one, we used our separator, which is what I prefer, a little period. Um, it's more common, I guess, even though it's not as cool, to use a colon. And then others... Uh, I have at least one dictionary that does this. We'll use like a superscript for the verse. It doesn't matter what separator you use between the chapter and the verse. What matters is that it's always the same order. Book, chapter, verse. Okay? So whatever separator somebody uses, it's, it's kind of secondary. Um, this is how we do a range of verses. 1 Kings 3.1-4 means 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. However, 1 Kings 3-4 means 1 Kings chapters 3 and 4. This 
is like three or four verses. I forget how to count if it's inclusive or whatever. And this is like dozens and dozens of verses, right? Because this, the first one is referring to a verse range, and this doesn't have that verse marker, so it's actually two whole chapters of, uh, of Kings in that case. Here's a complicated one. 1 Kings 3.4,7,15, semicolon 16.1-20, semicolon 18. It is, it's, it's, I can imagine how intimidating this is to like somebody that's just coming in and they're like, man, I've been reading books my whole life. Like I, I, I went to school and like this is just a gobbledygook, but just, just, to, just to show how it works. The first one there refers to 1 Kings as opposed to 2 Kings. There are two books of Kings. If you really want to know, it's because it didn't fit on one scroll in ancient times. It just couldn't make an, a scroll long enough to fit both 1 and 2 Kings on it. So they, they cut it in half and they said, all right, this is the first part of Kings, this is the second part of Kings. So that's how we mark it. So the number before the book. The book name is next, Kings, and then the chapter. Chapter 3 and then dot 4 means verse 4. Comma means we're going to another verse. So 3.4, comma 7, or 3 colon 4, comma 7 means verse 4, verse 7, verse 15. Then the semicolon means we're going to a new chapter. You see that? So we use commas for verses and semicolons for chapters. It's not 100%, but it's fairly universal. Here's a couple of other things. If we want to cite just part of a verse, let's say we want to cite the first half of a verse, we use A. In the second half of the verse, we use B. 1 Kings 3, 4, A is the first half of the verse. 1 Kings 3, 4, B would be the second half of the verse. I really should have looked up this verse. I hope it's a good one. Um, Anyhow, then we can, uh, we, can, we can use other letters in our references. The F. Have you ever wondered about the F? 1 Kings 3, 4, F. What is that F? It means folio, and it, it's uh, something that originally had meant the next page, but when, within Bible reference stuff, it means just the next verse. So 1 Kings 3, 4, F means 1 Kings 3, 4, and 5. So think of F as in following. So verse 4 and following is verse 5. However, FF means all the verses to the end of the chapter. So 1 Kings 3, 4, FF means all the way to verse 28. And you will see these references from time to time when you, when you read stuff about the Bible, and it's helpful to look it up. When quoting, of course, it's common to use an ellipsis, the dot, dot, dot. That just means we skipped a, a section of a verse or even multiple verses. And then one last thing about references, just to wrap this up, is that it's very common to use abbreviations, to abbreviate a book of the Bible to just its first syllable. Um, people don't want to write it out all the way, so that's very common as well. All right, let's talk about ways to read the Bible just sort of winding down here before we review. You can read your Bible in a paper Bible. I brought one. I don't really use a paper Bible too much these days, but I brought one just to like show you. Um, there's something nice about a paper Bible, you know, where you can, you can stare at this text so much, and it doesn't really hurt your eyes like a screen. You know, there's, and there, there's something... You know, there's a smell to it. You know, something tactile. Tactile. You can write on it. You can highlight it. Uh, you know, you can use these ribbons, right? You know, there's just something nice about. It's just something nice about that. Uh, so that's the paper Bible. As I mentioned for this class, um, I'm using the NRSV, New Revised Standard Version. <clears throat> there's something something too that's great about the Bible, like the physical, getting a physical Bible is that it's great for avoiding distractions. I think so many of us have phone addictions and screen addictions that shorten our attention span. And like you, maybe you're reading and you read like three or four verses, and then you know, out of the corner of your eye, you see something flash. And you're like, oh, notification. What is it? Right? And then you, and then you come back, and now it's going to take you a little while to get back into it. Now you start really cruising, and boom, somebody calls you, right? So airplane mode, turn it down, go to a paper Bible, 
set a timer. I'm telling you, it, it could, it could that, that right there could change your life. I don't know. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Um, I usually use a timer when I read the Bible. I just set a timer, and then it will beep when I'm done, because otherwise I have no idea how long I've been doing it, and I don't, you know, I've usually got other things I need to get to. All right, website. Oh, so here, here are, are versions that I would recommend. I would recommend any standard version, usually indicated by the S in the abbreviated name, okay? So this is the New Revised Standard Version, English Standard Version, New American Standard Bible, Christian Standard Bible, other... Standard typically means that it's a literal translation. It's trying to give you as close as, as they can to the original and have it still be good English. There are lots of other kinds of Bibles that maybe are for good for other reasons, but I think for this class those would be more helpful. Let's talk about websites. I've got a couple here, BibleGateway.com, BibleHub.com. They're freebie websites you can use to get tons of different versions of the Bible, different, different languages as well. Um, you can use an app on your phone. Uh, two popular ones are the Uversion app. A lot of people use that. It's, I think it's totally free, and it has a lot of versions on it. And then another one, maybe you don't know about this, is called Bible.is. It's really good for um, reading the Bible. And they have uh, original language stuff, which is kind of my thing. So, like, you can have it read you the Bible in Hebrew or in Greek, you know, or English or French or Telugu or whatever language you want. You know, they, they are doing these things now. So I don't know if they have Telugu, but uh, they have a lot of different languages. So an app on your phone... Um, the problem with reading the Bible on the phone, once again, is the distractions. Like, if you, you just put your phone in airplane mode or something, or do not disturb, do something, because otherwise some stupid app is going to, like, say, hey, did you know? And it's like, no, I'm trying to read my Bible. I'm not, I don't want to know right now. Or an app on your computer, uh, I do this a lot. I have both Logos and Accordance. They're, they're very good, very good Bible software. They both start at $49. Um, Logos goes up to $10,800, depending on how many packages you buy. Accordance goes up to $42,568 for like the top level package. I've got several thousand dollars invested in Accordance personally um, and do not regret it at all. You know, it's just very, very helpful to have Bible software that is able to load in all these commentaries and other books, uh, books to help. So, look, do it. Do whatever you want to do. Right? Get get a paper one. Use a website. Use your phone app. Use a PC app. Whatever you want to do. The point is, get to know your Bible. And we're going to get more into translations and tools later. I'm not really going to get into that right now. But for this course, I'm not going to assume. Um, you have any, any, uh, anything other than just access to a Bible. I'm not going to assume that you have some fancy Bible software or a commentary or whatever. We're just going to, for this course, we're just looking at what the Bible actually says directly. And as I mentioned before, I'm going to be using the NRSV for this class. Um, and I think that's about what I wanted to say. Let's review. The Bible is not a book but a library of 66 books. The Bible breaks into two main divisions, Old Testament, 39 books, and New Testament, 27 books. The Bible contains different genres that affect how we read, including historical narrative, biography, law, poetry, prophecy, wisdom, epistles, and apocalyptic. And people have other ones if you wanted to add more in. But you know, the, 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 the idea here, which I, I want to stress one more time, is that you just don't read uh, somebody retelling a story about a dream the same way that you would read a newspaper, right? So genre matters when it comes to how you read something. Next uh, review point. Even within genres, we can find subgenres like parables, riddles, aphorisms, monologues, and dialogues. Although God inspired the text of Scripture, other editions of publishers are subjective and devoid of divine authority. References, reference styles vary, but follow the format of book, chapter, verse. 
The Bible is available as a bound book on websites, on phone apps, and on computer apps. You can even get a piece of jewelry where they have used some sort of laser to engrave it with the entire text of the Bible, and it fits right in a pendant you can wear around your neck. I mean, the Bible is the most accessible book in all human history. It's really exceptional. Next time, we'll look at reading the Bible in context. This is so important. Context, context, is like real estate. Location, location, location. Context, context, context. If it's so easy to skate, take Scripture out of context and read it from a 21st century Western perspective and just miss what it's saying. Uh, so we're going uh, to spend some time on that. Maybe, maybe as much as 80% of common errors you can avoid just by doing the effort to read it within its historical context. And so we'll turn to that subject next time as we continue in our class, Read the Bible for Yourself. Thank you.